Okay, we're at this incredible location along the Snake River, just south of Jackson, Wyoming. And there's some beautiful backlit trees. They're yellow, I think they're willow trees. I'm going to paint those for this little demonstration. This is just a eight by 10 panel, about a half inch cropped off on each side. Um, I just had somebody a few minutes ago park right here. It did, it doesn't block my view, but it does kind of make it strange for the recording of the demonstration. Hopefully that won't happen. But anyway, it's a gorgeous state. There's not a cloud in the sky. I might end up doing two paintings here, I'm not sure. My intent was to get to Grand Teton National Park and do some painting there, but I'm falling behind because of the incredible beauty I'm seeing on the way. But anyway, uh, I'm gonna get this painting started. So I uh, hope you enjoy. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is block in my darkest darks, which is my typical way of working. This is a pretty small canvas. Allows me to work a little bit quicker. Seeing like this, I would um, really love to do bigger. I've done a number of big canvases on this trip and I'm running out of time. We leave on Friday. It's only Monday, but the thing I'm concerned about is the lighting. It is supposed to get, oh, there's some kind of bee around here. Get away. It is supposed to um, get a little more cloudy. Also, the temperature is going to start going up, which probably means haze because there's still those wildfires going on. out west. And when I do these, I'm not doing these to create a finished piece of work. I'm doing them to, uh, it's note taking take a lot of photos but when I have uh, unique lighting scenarios that I haven't painted before or that I would just enjoy painting that's when I do the plein air plus it's just incredible being in a spot like this nothing like hearing the water in the background and the rapids and everything when you're working on a painting really puts you in the mood and I think it helps too to um, kind of make it more authentic I paint along noisy roadsides and things like that, but um, it's nothing like being able to paint where it's nice and quiet and, and you hear the sounds of nature. There is a highway right up the hill here. You can kind of hear it. Hopefully you guys can't hear it. I can, but it's not too bad. So I'm working from the darkest darks out to my lighter colors. This is not the only way to work, but this is the word, this is the way that's most successful for me. Just laying a foundation in here. I was really torn apart between painting this and a scene just slightly over this way. But I'm glad I picked this. This is very nice.
have to kind of apologize in advance for my heavy breathing when I'm doing this and talking. I still think I have not acclimated well to the uh, high altitude. I was listening back on some of the videos I did over the last few days and it's like, my goodness, sounds like I'm running a marathon or something. I've been here for a week, but I'm still not quite acclimated. Probably means I'm a bit out of shape. I'm gonna consciously try to not <laughs> breathe heavy as I work on this. Okay, the main thing that I'm really after is the yellows and these uh, cool colors back in the background. It's kind of lavender colors. I really want to get that relationship down between those two. I'm not too concerned about the drawing. Just really want those color relationships. I want that glow basically. Still using very thin paint. Which really allows me to manipulate it later on. Clean my brush a little bit. If I decide to paint this scene later in the studio, I'm going to be so happy that I have this study. It's not absolutely necessary to do these studies, but they are very helpful. Of course, it does take, you know, experience and skill to be able to even create these studies in the first place. But if you have the means to do it, I highly encourage you to because in obtaining this skill and going through all the struggle and pain and heartache of creating a lot of bad plein air paintings, you're going to be spending time observing nature and looking at it firsthand rather than just through a photograph. And in doing that, you're going to learn a lot through all those failed paintings. So 
So don't let fear stop you from doing this if you really want to uh, get serious about landscape painting. Okay, I just cleaned up my palette a little bit. I'm gonna go back in and put in some of the foreground. There's some really neat rocks right there in this foreground. I don't know if I'm gonna put them in or not. One of the most important things you can do as a landscape artist is really capture the overall difference in color and value between your flat areas, your plains, plain, your flat plains, and your uprights, which are your trees, and then you know any sky or any hills or anything like that. Each of them usually has some slight variation in the in the value and colors compared to the other ones. So, in the, so like with this ground plane, it's gonna be a little bit lighter than what's going on here for the most part. Um, the, there are caveats to that, but you wanna be aware of the general principle before you go crazy with all the exceptions. And if I capture that um, over anything else, then I've succeeded. Basically, if I can get the value and temperature relationships between the ground and the trees and the sky or the mountains or whatever, then all the little details and things like that, I can get that from the photos. But the photos sometimes are not going to give me those differences that I'm trying to capture when I'm planar painting. Or at least I, they might be there, but I'm just going to be kind of ignorant of them. Okay, now let's go in and block in this background. This is a part where if I get that relationship correct between the background and here, then I'm good. I, I could literally stop at that point and go home with enough information between that and the photos to create a painting. I'm gonna take it beyond that but once I get to that point where my relationships are correct it's a big sigh of relief might be a really big sigh given how this mountain air has affected me I think we're around 6,000 feet above sea level here I've been much higher, but I was also a bit younger too. So I'm just kind of carefully painting around that tree foliage, especially where it's a little thicker with the yellows. Where it's thinner, I can overpaint it a little bit and not disturb too much of what's going on there.
keeping it relatively thin. There are some highlights on these trees because these are all these are all trees back here. They're uh, spruce trees, it looks like, but they do have some sunlight hitting them on the top. We're dealing with a pretty much completely backlit scenario. Some conventional wisdom says you shouldn't paint completely backlit. You should always have, you know, three quarter toward the light or three quarter away from the light. But there are just some scenes that are completely backlit that are just incredible. So for me, conventional wisdom goes out the window when I see these scenes. And really, it's about painting what you want. What you like. Down in this area, um, it's no longer trees, it's actually this slope of land that goes down to the water. And it gets a little warmer in there. I can definitely see more reds in there. And just a hair darker. So I'm mainly going with uh, a lizard and permanent some viridian, a little bit of yellow ochre to tone it down. Let's see how that does. Not bad, I'm gonna cool it off just slightly and lighten it up just a little bit. I keep having these little bugs laying on me. And that's really where the true compliment happens. You have this lavender yellow right in here. It definitely gets bluer and greener as it goes up, but right in here is that lavender yellow, or that, yeah, that lavender yellow um, compliment. That's probably what subconsciously drew me to want to paint this in the first place. No pun intended. Though that was a pretty good pun, I have to say. Okay, I'm gonna take some of this color. I'm gonna add a little bit of ochre and viridian to it. Some blue to darken it, a little more ochre. I'm going to uh, suggest the highlights in those evergreens. They're very subtle. 
Now, when you're out here and you're looking at them, if you look at them on their own, they look, those highlights look green. And so there's gonna be a temptation to paint green, but you don't wanna do that. There is a touch of green in them, but not much. And I don't want to go crazy with these because you could just end up destroying the simplicity of the scene back there. But I'd like to remind myself that there was something up there. In the studio, if I decide to paint this, I'll um, have a lot more time to monkey around with those things. But out here, I just want to get done as much as possible. thicker with my paint just because I'm pretty confident about the um, colors and values slight transitions in here where in this background area it does get a little warmer and a little darker as we come down the hill which makes sense things get cooler and lighter as they recede same thing with the hill it's not as apparent but as that hill goes up it's gonna get cooler and lighter because it's moving away from you. It's moving up more into the air. It's not an ultra important thing to show in this painting. Because like I said, I, I already got the main business done. I got these relationships. Uh, I got the relationships of the overall, you know, the whole composition the whole scene. But if I can get some of those little transitions in there, you know, why not? They can really enhance a painting. And it's going to do a lot more for you than all the detail that's there. See, just getting a little darker with this lavender down here is really bringing things out. Okay, I thought I'd bring you guys in a little closer. A uh, big thing I'm worried about this area right here is my focal point. In 
and now I'm going pretty thick. Because I'm working wet on wet and I'm pulling this yellow color into this uh, lavender color here, I have to wipe my brush after every few strokes to wipe the excess lavender off that built up. Otherwise I just get a big mess. Okay, back in here, there's these little highlights of trees that are catching a lot of sunlight. Just gonna put a hint of that color in there, just a note of it. Okay, I mixed up some very dark, dark. Gonna go in and just refine this evergreen tree here. Just going after the general character and not after getting every single little branch the way it is.
but putting in this trunk is really helping to emphasize that light, that backlit feel. You can in the shadows, and this is where planar painting is so wonderful, you can see a little bit of the cooler greens that are picking up the cool sky behind us. I just want to give a slight indication of that. So back in the studio, like, oh yeah, those things were there. You could see those cool green colors. Relying just on a photo, especially a JPEG photo, you're just going to get a bunch of black there basically. You're probably not going to see all those little tiny transitions. running out of yellow ochre. Okay, just replenish my cad yellow light and my yellow ochre. not exactly like this but I'm just adding these little tiny leaves give it a bit of interest it's another nice thing about planar painting is that when you painted a scene once from life, it gives you, at least for me, it gives me like an authority over the scene where I feel, okay, I have conquered you, I have mastered you, and now I can manipulate you, now I can change you to be how I want you to be. When you're working from a photo, and especially if you only have like one photo of the scene, that's why you know, if you're working from photos, take a lot of them. But when you're working from a photo, 
Um, you know, there can be a tendency to become a slave to the photograph, or, and it's usually because of lack of confidence. But if you've already painted this scene once from life, you're pretty confident. And that confidence allows you to go back in and really do some stuff that you might not have had the courage to do before. Gotta take the paddle knife. Just wanna have a little bit of fun with those darks down there. So before me, there are some rocks. And I'm going to just kind of imply one or two of these rocks. It's more just taking a note. And like in plenary painting to note taking. You take your notes, then you go and you write your paper. Go back in the studio and make your final. Well, you don't want to get too hung up on the results. Or in capturing every little thing you see. So I just dropped the brush. Okay, so when I flip my head over and I look at the scene, I'm seeing a little bit more lavender in there than what I originally thought. It's just touching that up a little bit. And then we're about done with this. My camera's starting to overheat. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this and thank you very much for watching. If you're an oil painter and want to take your skills to the next level or just having difficulty getting started, you don't have to go it alone. You can take live online oil painting classes right from your own home. All you need is a computer, an internet connection, and your painting supplies. Every week, we'll meet live as a group and work on a painting step by step with me sharing over 20 years of artistic experience to help you become the best artist you can be. Want more details? Click on the link below in the description or go to my website, 
www.jasontaco.com and click on workshops in the upper menu. Mm -hmm.